come on, come on, give God praise, amen. Amen and amen. Well, what a delight it is to be in Mobile, Alabama on the Sunday before Easter at Pathway Church. I'm just thrilled to be here and honored with this opportunity. It's been spring break at ORU. Lisa and I have been out of the country. I got back in. I jumped on an airplane yesterday and got to Mobile. And uh, I'm excited about what God is doing in Pathway and uh, this church. Welcome to all of our campuses out there and to Cambodia. Come on. That was amazing. Fantastic. I want to say a special thanks to the Johnson family, to Travis and Kelly, um, Courtney McKenna that are ORU students, and to Blake, of course, who is a soccer star here in uh, Alabama, and uh, we appreciate him very much. But um, the Johnsons are a special family, and uh, Travis and Kelly, a special couple. Uh, they not only lead Pathway, they lead uh, people for care and learning. They lead uh, the buy a life, change a tree. No, I'm teasing. I know it's not the way you said. <laughs> buy a tree, change a life. Uh, my son, uh, son-in-law and daughter are missionaries with four of our grandchildren in Paraguay. They just recently moved back down. They lived there for several years and went back down. They do the uh, buy a tree, change a life this last year. They've gotten close to the Johnsons. And uh, the closer we get to them, the more we appreciate that Travis is a, um, a man of God. It was said of Barnabas that he was uh, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And I would say of Travis, the best definition I know of leadership is turning vision into reality. Leaders turn vision into reality. And Travis Johnson does that on a regular basis. He's a man that is committed to God, a man of integrity, a man not afraid to make a stand. Uh, and God has blessed him, and we're grateful. I want the Johnsons to stand up because I got a feeling that Pathway Church would love to just say we love you to the Johnsons. Would you stand up? Come on, would you tell them you love them? Come on, come on. Tell them you love these guys. Amen. Come on. Come on. Well, it's an honor to be here. I do bring you greetings from Oral Roberts University, where a university this year will have about 6,500 students. Uh, for in the last four years, we've had students at our university from 151 nations around the world. So we're a global university with a uh, main campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we have no debt. Hallelujah. We are in the black. Thank you, Jesus. And we've had uh, consecutive years of enrollment growth for a while now. We had the largest incoming freshman class in all-time history this past fall and the largest spring in history I believe in the next generation. I believe that every single dollar, energy, prayer, sermon, uh, whatever it takes, uh, lesson taught, invested in the next generation is one of the greatest investments we could ever make. So I commend you as a church for investing in the next generation. I've been thrilled to see young people on the front row uh, in the first service and in this service. I think you ought to give the young people of this church a big hand. They are awesome, and I believe in them a lot. In fact, I believe in them so much, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Gen, Generation Z Born for the Storm. Now, Gen Z are those uh, young people born between 1995 and 2015. If you were born between 1995 and 2015, raise your hand. Okay, wow, that's a big group, bigger than I thought. Anyway, I believe in you. I believe this is the greatest generation in the history of the planet. It's also the largest generation on the planet right now. One-third of all human beings were born between 1995 and 2015 that are alive today. They are going to change the world more than any generation in human history. God's hand is upon them. They are innovative. They know technology. They are unusual. <laughs> they are. And they are unique, every one of them. And this book, Mom and Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, and even students here, will help you get a glimpse of Generation Z. I don't promise it will make you understand them completely, but you'll know more about them than you would have. I don't claim, I don't claim to understand them, and I live with them all the time at ORU, but I love this generation. So that book's out in the lobby. A new book that I just uh, did this last summer called The Power of One, Reaching Every Person on Earth. Uh, this is a book really out of my heart and my passion to reach people for Jesus. I believe we have a chance in our generation to bring the good news of Jesus to every single person on earth. And we are praying and working together across the body of Christ to do that 
before the 2,000 year anniversary of Jesus' burial, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, the giving of the Great Commission, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which will be in 2033. And so we're uniting literally across the body of Christ uh, to work together to bring the good news of Jesus to every person. Wouldn't it be great if we could say that every person in Mobile, Alabama, and every person in Southern Alabama had an opportunity to know Jesus Christ, had a clear presentation of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, and knew the good news. I believe that can happen. I don't think we should assume it has happened, but I believe it can happen if God's people understand the power of one life. Also, a new book that's just come out in January uh, it's actually a rewrite of a book I did about 20 years ago. I did a number of years of 40-day fast personally, and out of that wrote this book called Fasting Forward, Advancing Your Spiritual Life Through Fasting. I've seen God do my, the greatest miracles in my life, uh, change of direction, uh, favor of God, supernatural blessings, supernatural healings out of times of fasting. This book will help you. It's very practical. We also have a little uh, journal that you can use to journal your fast out there. So if you're hungry for God, you may want to get that book. I think there's some kind of special deal. Please buy them all so we don't have to ship any of them home. And if you can't afford one, tell people out there, I just can't afford one today, and they'll give you whatever book you want. Please tell them to do that. All right, good. Well, it's Palm Sunday, okay? This is the Sunday uh, before Passion Week when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, the king lowly on a donkey, defying logic as he always did, uh, being worshipped by the masses only within a few days for that same mass of people to yell crucify him and Jesus to go to the cross. So in many ways, I'm going to preach a message today that would be the prequel to Easter, okay? This is the Easter prequel message, and I'm calling it Reverse the Curse. I'm going to focus today on one thing that Jesus accomplished on the cross of reversing the curse against us and uh, ask you to claim that blessing for yourself. Mark chapter 15, verse 16 through 20 says, The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Corollary to that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. To Adam God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat fruit from, eat fruit from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Now being a vegetarian is not a curse, but it is part of eating the plants from the field. Would you bow your head? Father, I thank you for your blessing. I thank you for allowing me to be at Pathway Church this morning. And Lord, for the next few minutes, I pray you'd help me crawl up behind your cross and let people see what you've done for us on Calvary. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I pray at every campus, every person that listens to me today, Holy Spirit, that you would work in their life and that they would live in the fullness of your blessing in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. This concept of curse uh, is quite unique. You don't hear a lot said about it, a lot preached about it, but I want to talk about curse for a little bit. Then we'll talk about blessing as well today. Curse comes from several Hebrew words in the Old Testament that mean things like set apart for punishment or misery, the absence of God's blessing, to pronounce negatively against someone or to pronounce punishment over them. In the Greek in the New Testament, the word is used and uh, comes from a Greek word that means imprecation, execration, or an angry denouncement, a spoken curse against someone. Cursed. Have you ever felt like you were cursed? 
The world in which we live is cursed. In fact, uh, God cursed uh, the serpent. He cursed Eve. He cursed Adam. And he cursed the ground. He cursed the earth. And pronounced that the earth would now move toward disorganization and would produce thorns and thistles. In other words, instead of the great order of the Garden of Eden and all of its beauty and all of its organization, the world would now move toward disorder. And so if left alone, a yard, a field, a fence row, all move toward disorganization and over time will produce thorns and thistles. It's part of the curse. It is no coincidence that when Jesus is on his way to the cross, and they take him to the whipping post and the praetorium in the house of judgment before the Roman legion, that they twist together thorns and put it on his head and hit him on the head several times, driving the thorns into his scalp so that as Jesus goes through the streets of Jerusalem and goes to Golgotha or Mount Calvary, he carries the thorns with the cross being crowned with the symbol of the curse, coming, I believe, to break the curse over us by his obedience to death. Now, there are a lot of reasons people can be cursed. Obviously, the earth is cursed because of Adam and Eve's sin against God. And all of us feel the effects of that, and we're all in many ways under the curse of sin until we trust in the cross of Calvary. But there are other things. Uh, Scripture tells us that the sins of the father and mother can be visited on the generations to the third and fourth generation. So there may be a negative uh, energy, a negative spiritual impact on your life because of the sins of your grandparents or great-grandparents or your parents. People that have plunged their family into poverty, bankruptcy. It lasts sometimes for many generations. People who have been abused or are abusers plunge their family into a cycle of abuse for generations. People who are alcoholics, it is stated that much more likely than are their children and grandchildren to be alcoholic. Some people call these generational curses. Or there could be curses pronounced on you by others. Things set over you that create a spiritual negative dynamic over your life. Maybe as a child, somebody told you you were stupid and you believed them. I've been working on a message lately for Generation Z. It's called, Who Told You You Were Crazy? It's a pretty good message, by the way. You know, there's this mental illness stuff going around. But who told you you were crazy? Yeah. So sometimes the pronouncement of others brings this negative cloud over your life. But mostly, 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 cursing or curses in the Bible come because of disobedience. Now, God decided to give Israel a graphic picture of the power of blessing and the power of cursing when they entered the land of Canaan. In fact, he said, Moses, when when the people of, of God go into the land of Canaan, I want you to go between two mountains, and I want you to send uh, some of the representatives of God up one of the mountains called Mount Gerizim, and there they will pronounce blessing, and the other group go up Mount Ebal, and there they will pronounce cursing, and the people in the valley will be called to make a decision of whether they want blessing or cursing in their life, and the difference maker will be their obedience to the law of God. In fact, he says in Deuteronomy 28, if you're obedient to the law of God, you will be blessed. If you were to read Deuteronomy 28, I'll just give you a summary of it. I won't go into all the scriptures about it. But let me just tell you some of the ways that obedient uh, people are are blessed. People that are obedient to God are blessed uh, geographically. God says you'll be blessed in the city and you'll be blessed in the field. Wherever you go, you'll be blessed. You get on an airplane, you're blessed. You get off the airplane, you're blessed. Years ago, I went on my very first mission trip as a 24-year-old to Indonesia. I I realized when I got off the plane in Indonesia, I was the same Billy Wilson as when I got on the plane in Cleveland or Chattanooga, Tennessee. But I was blessed. 
whether in Tennessee or in Indonesia. I've learned that geography does not stop your blessing. You'll be blessed in your family. Uh, Deuteronomy says the fruit of your body will be blessed. Your children will be blessed if you are obedient. Your family will be blessed. You'll be blessed financially. God says in Deuteronomy 28, I'll bless your livestock, I'll bless your food, I'll bless your wealth. You'll be blessed financially if you're obedient. Now, we know that in church, right? If we treat, if we obey God with our finances and tithe and offering and respond to the Holy Spirit in generosity as he tells us to, we will be blessed financially. Everybody say amen to that. We know that. We've proven that, and you can prove that in your life. You'll be blessed positionally. God says you'll be blessed in your coming in and you'll be blessed in your going out. When you enter a job, you'll be blessed. When you leave a job, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed whether you're going in or coming out. You'll be blessed in battle. The enemy that comes against you one way, if you're obedient to God, will flee before you seven ways. I like that one a lot. You'll be blessed with an open heaven. When you pray, the heavens will be open. And God will hear your cry and send rain from the heavens. You'll be blessed to be the lender and not the borrower. In fact, God says to Israel, if you're obedient to me, you're going to be a lending nation, not a borrowing nation. Man, somebody ought to read that in Congress about every week. (laughs) That's right. That's one of the signs that God is not blessing America. That we are in such debt in America. God says, if you're obedient to my law and to my word, you'll be a lending nation, not a not a in debt nation. Something to think about. You'll be blessed in your leadership. You'll be the head and not the tail. But then God says, but if you're disobedient to me, if you don't obey my law, if you don't keep my commandments, you will be cursed. Boy, the curses are tough. So Mount Gerizim is the blessing place. Mount Ebal then, curses were pronounced. You'll be cursed geographically. You can't get away from it. Doesn't matter where you go, you're going to be under this negative spiritual dynamic. The absence of God's blessing, you'll be cursed. You can go to Homer, Alaska, sort of the end of the earth, you'll still be cursed. You can go to Key West, Florida. I meet people in those places that have ran as far as they can run, as far as land will let them go, and they still can't get away from it. They still are absent of God's blessing. They're still cursed. You can go to the city. You can go to the field. You can move out into the country. You can move to New York. Wherever you are, if you're not obeying God, I promise you there's going to be an absence of blessing and a dynamic against you that is negative. You'll be cursed in your family. Your children will be cursed. About the time you think they're going to do good, they won't do good. You'll be cursed financially. About the time you think you've got enough money in the bank, there'll be holes in your pocket and you'll wonder where the money went. About the time you think you're going to get on your feet, all of a sudden something happens. A car breaks down, a dental thing happens, a hospital bill, and there it goes again. And the cycle just keeps going over and over again. If you're not obedient to God, your finances will not be blessed. You'll be cursed positionally. You'll be cursed with a brazen heaven. You'll be cursed with habitual sickness and disease, according to Deuteronomy 28. You'll be cursed before your enemies, and when they come against you one way, you will flee seven ways. You'll be cursed by debt. What a curse. You'll be cursed in your leadership. You'll be the tail and not the head. The curses of disobedience are actually more severe in Deuteronomy 28 even than the blessings of obedience. So the people were brought between these two mountains and given the choice, will you obey God's law or not? Of course, they would say, we want the blessing. We want to be blessed in the city and the field. We want to be blessed in every way. We want God's favor, his smile, his help, his pleasure. Only one problem. As hard as they tried, they couldn't obey the law completely. This was part of the curse. The more they tried to obey God, the less they found themselves obeying God in their own strength. And so when they tried to keep the law and live on Mount Gerizim instead of Mount Ebal, they found that it was difficult at the least, but really impossible. And so there was a need for another mountain and someone to break the curse. Let's read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. 
For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the, for the righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us, listen, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. The law called anyone that was hanged on a tree or on a pole cursed. Now, to be honest, I've, I've preached most of my adult life. Since I was about 17 years old, I've been preaching the gospel. So it'll be 50 years soon that I've been preaching God's word in some way, some shape, some form. I got saved at 16, radically converted, and shortly thereafter, they started putting me in pulpits saying, you're going to preach, and I'd say, okay, and I'd try, and God would help me. And for most of my adult life, I've I've preached uh, the gospel, and I've preached from Galatians at times, and I've even preached about uh, the curse being changed uh, through the power of Jesus, but I never knew what this meant. Cursed is everyone that hanged on a tree until studying for this message, and realized this is something out of the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23, it says, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. Wow. Wow. And so realizing the curse of the law is though wanting to live in the blessings of God, we cannot do it in our strength. God brings forth another mountain called Mount Calvary where his son Jesus would come in human flesh without sin and would take the curse as his crown and would go be hanged on a pole on a tree becoming a curse for us so that he might reverse the curse and in Jesus we might be blessed with the blessings of God. Woo! Hallelujah! <laughs> oh my. So the Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham might come on our life through faith, that when we put our trust in the cross, in what Jesus did on the cross, we enter into the blessings of God, and the curse is reversed, and we live with God's pleasure and God's blessing upon our life and not curse on our life. The blessing of Abraham is in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will, listen, this is part of the blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Hallelujah. When you are blessed by God, every curse is broken. When you are blessed by God, every curse is broken. Now, we come into blessing by the obedience of Jesus Christ on the cross and by our obedience. The good news is because of the power of the cross, the dynamic of the law and the dynamic of sin can be defeated. And so if you believe in Jesus and live in Jesus, you will be obedient to the law of God. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments, live in obedience. And when you live in obedience, you live in the blessings of God and nothing can stop it. Somebody say amen. Nothing, nothing, nothing can stop it. Even people that want to curse you can't. (laughs) They can't take your blessing. They didn't give it to you. They can't take it. Amen. It's an account in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. God's people were journeying from Egypt. They'd been in the wilderness, and now they were on their way to the land of Canaan. They come through on the, what would that be, on the east side of the River Jordan, And they're marching through the land of the Ammonites and the Canaanites and the Moabites. When they get to the land of Moab, the king of Moab, Balak, or Balak, was uh, afraid of them. He needed to be. They numbered over 600,000 men and then the women and children. Most people believe that they numbered over 2 million people on a march through the wilderness. They were defeating everyone that was in their way. And so the king of Moab gets this bright 
idea that he needs somebody to put a curse on them. So he sends to the north and he finds this prophet, not an not a Israelite prophet, but the man that was supposedly a prophet, a diviner, uh, named Balaam and ask him to come and put a curse on Israel so he can defeat them and they won't destroy the Moabites. Well, when they get to Balaam, they bring money with them uh, the entourage from the king of Moab, and when they get to his house, he says, uh, "He says, wait a minute, let me sleep on it. He sleeps on it. He gets a vision from God. God says, don't go with them. He gets up the next morning, says, I'm not going with you. I can't do it. God's blessed those people. I can't curse them. They go back. They tell the king of Moab. The king of Moab gets some more important people from his kingdom, people with influence, people that are influencers, people that had a big following on uh, whatever kind of media there was that day. He sends them and he says, when you get there, tell him there is no price too great, whatever he needs. I'll pay it and I want him to know how important it is by sending him all these important people. So they get there. Balaam says, I, I told you, I can't prophesy against these people. I can only do what God tells me. But wait a minute, let me, let me pray about it some more. Shouldn't have done that, but he did. God tells him that night, uh, okay, okay, go ahead and go. So the next morning, he starts on the way. He gets on his donkey. They're riding toward Moab from a, a kingdom up north, Peor. And on his way, he, uh, the donkey does some strange things. All of a sudden, at one point, the donkey turns out into the field. Balaam gets ticked off at his donkey, gets off, grabs his ears, gets a stick, and beats the donkey. Gets back on the donkey, rides a little further. Next time, he gets between two walls, and the donkey moves over to the side and crushes his leg up against the wall. Balaam is so frustrated at this stubborn, disobedient donkey. He gets off, he beats him again. Next time, the donkey comes to a place that's very narrow. He has no place to get around, no place to go. He can't turn to the right or left. He can't get around, and so he just lays down. Now, what Balaam did not see, the donkey had seen, and that was an angel was in the way. And so every time the angel was there, he turned to the right and went out in the field. Next time the angel was there, he webs up against the wall trying to get around the angel. This time the angel's there, he can't get around him. The donkey just lays down. Balaam is upset. He grabs the donkey by the ear, grabs him by the jaw, slaps him across the head, gets a big stick and starts beating the donkey. And the donkey says, why are you beating me? Now, this is not a political joke, but it could be that donkeys talk. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm in the land of elephants down here in Alabama. You can take it home with you, but. <clears throat> the donkey says, hey, you've been riding me all these years. Have I ever done you wrong? Balaam says, no, you've been a pretty good donkey, but you've lost your mind lately. And then all of a sudden, God opens the eyes of Balaam, and he sees the angel. And God says to Balaam, if this donkey hadn't turned out of the way the three times he did, I would have killed you. He saved your life. Sometimes things in our life are for our good, even when we don't like them. Somebody say amen. amen. But God says, Balaam says, okay, I'll go home. God says, no, no, go on with them. Just only say what I tell you to say. So they ride to Moab. They get to Moab. He meets Balak, the king. Balak says, I'm so glad you're here. I want you to curse these people so they don't destroy my kingdom. So he brings him out and he shows him part of the encampment. Two million people, it's huge. He shows him a piece of it. Ba Balaam says, okay, let's sacrifice some animals. They sacrifice a bunch of animals. And Balaam then uses his divining capacity. And he's going to divine a curse against God's people. And he opens his mouth. And as he opens his mouth, he starts blessing them. <laughs> and Balak can't believe it. He said, I'm going to pay you whatever it takes to curse these people. And he said, you have blessed them. And Balaam says, I, I tried to curse them, but every time I tried, I blessed them. So they tried again the second time. He opens his mouth and he, he starts to curse them. And this time when he starts to curse them, he blesses them again. <laughs> Balak says, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. He said, I, I, let's go over here. Let's see them in a different light. Maybe you've had a bad day. Maybe you're just not seeing the picture. Let's go look at the bigger picture. He takes him over. He shows him the bigger picture of all these people camped out. He says, now curse them. They, they, 
uh, sacrifice animals again. And then the Bible says this, listen to this, in, in, in Numbers chapter 24, verse 1 through 9. Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to divination as other times, but turned his face toward the wilderness. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel camp by tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God this time came on him. And he spoke his message, the prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, prophecy of one whose eyes see clearly, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty and falls prostrate, and her eyes are open. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel. Like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloe plants by the Lord, uh, planted by the Lord, the cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from your buckets. Their, their seed will have abundant water. Their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones in pieces with their arrows. They pierce them like a lion. They crouch and lie down like a lioness who dares to rouse them. May those who bless you be blessed and those who curse you be cursed curse. The blessing of Abraham was on them and he could not curse them. <laughs> Woo! Nehemiah 13 and 2 says it this way, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water but hired, had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them, parentheses, our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. Let me say to you, listen closely. If you're living under the blessings of God, God will turn every curse into a blessing. Whatever they try to do to you, God will turn it around. He'll reverse the curse over and over and over again. It may be like Joseph. Somebody may lie on you. They may put you in jail. They may put you down. They may try to forget about you. And God will just reverse the curse and use it for your promotion and lift you up and make you second in all of Egypt. Like David leaving Jerusalem after Absalom has come in to take authority. Shammai curses him as he leaves the city. David said, maybe God will restore me. God, God's favor is on David. He is the blessed of God. He comes back into the city in even greater strength. God will reverse the curse. Whatever the enemy tries, God will turn it around. Oh, come on, come on. Somebody may have it in for you at work. You may not get that promotion, that particular one. You need to trust God. You need to bless God. You need to keep being obedient to God. Keep doing right. Keep serving God. Stay at the cross. Keep believing in Jesus. And you know what? God will show you later on that that promotion was not for you. He had something else better in mind. He was holding you out for that. Woo, come on. I was young, but now I'm old. I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. I've been through all kinds of stuff. I've been appointed, disappointed, reappointed, unappointed. <laughs> and any other thing you could say about it. I've been put down. I've been criticized. I've been attacked. I've been pushed to the side. I've been pushed out. I've been pushed in. I've been lifted up. I've been put down. And every time as I look back over my journey, I thought, God, you always had something better in mind that I didn't know about. i got to trust you. <laughs> Woo, come on. <laughs> yeah, they're going to try to curse you. They're going to try to put you down. They're going to say all manner of evil about you Jesus said when they do pray for them they're going to need it they're going to need it here's what he says he says bless those who curse you pray for those who mistreat you they're going to need it the blessing of Abraham is I'll bless those that bless you I'll curse those that curse you when you start cursing someone that is blessed of God, you are in trouble. They're going to need it. And they're just serving the greater purpose of God. Every time they curse you, they are setting a dynamic of blessing upon your life. Every time they push you, they're pushing you right into the will of God. If you stay at the cross and you stay obedient to God, you're going to live on Mount Gerizim and not Mount Ebal, and you're going to be blessed everywhere you go and every way you go. God is going to bless you. Come on, give him praise. <laughs> Woo! 
Let me get home here. Psalm 109, 28. While they curse, may you bless. May those who attack me be put to shame. May your servant rejoice. Proverbs 3, 33. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Proverbs 26 and 2, the message version. You have as little to fear from an undeserved curse as from the dart of a wren or the swoop of a swallow. Little bird flying around, not going to bother you, not going to hurt you. Ultimately, God teaches us that in heaven there will be no more curse. Revelation 22 and 3 says, in heaven no longer will there be a curse. Hallelujah. We'll be back. It'll be restored. It'll be like the Garden of Eden. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth. There'll be healing for the nations and the flow of God's presence every single day. There'll be no curse. It will all be blessing. There'll be no absence of blessing. But even now, in the king of the curse, Jesus Christ, the curse is reversed. He took your sin, he took your curse to the cross. And as Jesus hung on a pole, on a tree, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. All the Jews around thought he must be a cursed man. He's hanging on a tree. He's wearing a crown made out of thorns. They didn't understand that Jesus was bearing that to break the power of the curse over our life. One man understood. There were two thieves on each side of Jesus. One of them railed on Jesus. They were being convicted by capital punishment for their sedition, their murder, their robbery. They had armed robbery and they had killed someone. The one man was cursed and he cursed Jesus on the cross, poured on him his vile. The other man understood his plight. He rebuked the man that was cursing Jesus, and he turns to the king. Wearing a crown of thorns with a sign over his head, the king of the Jews, in three languages, hanging on a tree. And he says to him, Jesus, would you remember me? This man had lived a cursed life. He was now dying a cursed death, hanging on a tree himself. His whole life had been a ruin. He had lived in a way that his family was under curse. His finances were under curse. His situation was under curse. He lived a wretched life, a, a broken life, a, a rebuked life, a, an ugly, desperate life. And now he was dying the ugly, horrible death of crucifixion. And in his moment of greatest need and greatest anguish, he turns to the king of the curse. He turns to the Lord wearing a crown of thorns. He turns to Jesus on a, thr on a tree, on a pole, and says, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> and in one instant, in one second, Jesus turns this cursed life into a life of blessing. Wow. Wow. Whole life cursed, whole life miserable, whole life wretched. And in one moment, Jesus turns it around. So that now, I believe, having studied this, especially for this book I did on the power of one, that this one man, this thief on the cross that confessed Jesus as Lord, this one man's testimony has probably been responsible for more people being in heaven than the testimony of any other one individual that's ever lived. Because millions of people have been on their deathbed and some preacher has come into their deathbed in their room, the hospital room, or at their home and has opened the Bible and has said, look, they've said there's no hope for me. I've lived a wretched life. I've lived under a curse my whole life. Everything's been negative about me. There's no hope for me. And the preacher said, oh, oh, there's still hope. Let me read you this story. And he opened up and said, here's a thief. At the end of his life, he just confessed Jesus as Lord. And Jesus turned it around and took him into paradise. Are you willing to confess Jesus as your Lord? And the person on their deathbed said, yes. If there's any hope left, I'm willing to trust Jesus with everything. And God turns it around again and again and again come on 
Somebody watching today, maybe you're in one of the locations or maybe you're in this room. You feel like you've gone too far, done too much, and there's simply no hope left for you. That is a lie. You're breathing, and you're in church today. And Jesus has reversed the curse. And if you'll turn to him, he can take the refuse of your life. The improbable will become possible if you'll trust him. Oh, my. I want every head to bow, please, for a moment. Every eye close. I'm going to give two calls, so listen closely. First of all, if you're here this morning and you say, Dr. Wilson, I have not been serving Jesus with my life, or wherever you're watching, but I want to. I've been living near Mount Ebal under the curses. It just all seems to go wrong for me. There seems to be some kind of dynamic over my life that is negative. And every time I think it's going to be good, it turns wrong. Every relationship, every situation just seems to have this negative cloud. I've not been serving Jesus, but I want to. I want to live under the blessings of God, and I want to give my life to someone who would die for me, even though I don't deserve it. I want to be like the one thief who confessed Jesus and was saved. If you're here this morning and you've not been serving Jesus, but you want to serve him, and you want to live a life of obedience, would you raise your hand right now and say, I've not been serving Jesus, Dr. Wilson, but I want to. That's right. God bless you, sir, ma'am. Up in the balcony as well. We love you. We're not going to embarrass you today. We just want you to be courageous and bold. Speak out and say, Lord, I want this negative dynamic over my whole life to stop. I know it's you drawing me to you. I know you've withheld your blessing so I would run to the cross and find your son. I want to do that today. I want to find you, Jesus. I want to serve you. I want to know you. Now, if you're here also this morning, you say, Dr. Wilson, I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm trying to serve him, but there's an area of my life It just seems to be under a negative dynamic, under a curse, it seems. Maybe it's a spirit of infirmity. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your family. And you would say today, Dr. Wilson, I want to move into a new area of obedience in this part of my life. I want to establish prayer in my home. I I want to... I want to begin to treat my finances the way God wants me to. I want to begin to trust God and worship Him and treat my body right. I need help. I need the King of glory to reverse the curse in this area of my life. If there's an area in your life that you need new and fresh blessing in, just raise your hand right now. Yeah, all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep it up just a moment. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Everyone that's raised your hand, whether you need to receive Jesus into your life and give him everything today, or there's an area of your life you need this dynamic broken and you need fresh blessing. I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. You raised your hand. Now just stand up and walk down to the front. Just get up and walk down to the front. While everybody is doing that, everybody else stand. So you guys that raised your hand, come on down to the front and join me. Come on. That's right. Come on, sir. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Be bold. Be courageous. That's right. Come on. Come on, come on. If you're here and you really need to give your life to Jesus, come on, join these as they come. Come on, let's give God thanks for what he's doing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you need forgiveness, be bold, be courageous. Say, Lord, I, I, I want to be like the man on that one side and not be afraid to speak up. Somebody here today that 
when you were a child, over and over again, someone spoke negatively over you. I think probably your father, but I'm not sure. But someone spoke negatively over your life, over and over again. It was abusive, abrasive, caustic. And some part of you, beyond even your human consciousness, began to believe the negative words spoke over you. Because of that, it became a curse to you and has been for a long time. Today, Jesus wants to reverse the curse. He broke its power. No, no, no weapon formed against you will prosper. But every tongue that has risen against you in judgment, you will condemn. You'll rise above it and condemn it. What, what was said about you was not true and will not be true. You will break its power in the days ahead. You will rise above this. You will, you will not be what was said about you. You'll be what God says about you. You'll be what the Bible claims for you to be. You're going to rise above this and live in the authority of Scripture. You're going to break this curse over your life. For somebody here today, you're in a family that habitually, habitually has fallen. I came from a family where uh, my father on one side and my grandfather on the other side failed uh, morally. My dad was restored and the last years of his life were wonderful. It was a time in his life, though, even as a minister, he failed, committed sexual sin. My grandfather, my mom's side, she, he, uh, he failed morally. I was afraid to get married. I, I was afraid that I couldn't keep my vows to Lisa. God has been so good to us. I'm not finished yet, but... For 47 years now, I have lived without any sexual sin. There's been no other woman. There's been no touch. There's been no wink. There's been no flirting. Would you give God praise? You can break the powers against you. Only, only, only by the power of the cross. Only by falling in love with Jesus. Only by running hard after him. God in his mercy has kept me all these years. And he will keep you. You can break the dynamic. You don't have to be a drunkard because your dad was a drunkard. You don't have to abuse someone because your mom abused someone. You don't have to live in sin because your parents lived in sin. God is going to give you a new bloodline, a new name, a new destiny, a new future. Hey, the curse is broken. In Jesus Christ. Everybody just come forward, raise your hands. Raise your hands up. You've come forward. Just lift them up. Say this with me. Jesus, say it out loud. Jesus, I surrender every part of my life. I bring everything to the cross. Come on, say it out loud. I bring everything to the cross. I give it all to you. Bless me, Lord. <laughs> Let your blessings come over my life. I believe you. I trust you. I want to obey you. Let me live in your blessing and reverse every curse. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you give him great praise? Come on. Come on. You that are up front, stay here for just a minute. <laughs> wow. There's somebody else back here in the crowd. You didn't come forward. You say to me, Dr. Wilson, I feel like I've got to have this negative dynamic broken. Is that you back there? Come on, there's somebody else. Just raise your hand and say, I, I need today. I got to break this dynamic. Just raise your hand up. I want to pray for you. Come on, raise it up. I want to break this dynamic that's negative over my life. I want the blessings of God. I want the power of God. I want the favor of God. I want the smile of God. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd break every curse in this room and let people go free in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Break the power and let them go free. 
Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you're the king of the curse. You wore my crown. You hung on my pole so I could be free. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys today.